Well, this is the one and only Thomas Jockin, who about a year ago, we had a discussion on lax and lax or nothing and Aristotle, and this proceeded to be a massive influence on a year's work. So it's just wonderful to have a chance to um, speak with Mr. Jockin again. Uh, he is, uh, it's hard to find a better scholar in uh, the medieval thinkers, Aristotle, uh, metaphysics, um, and an incredible entrepreneur as well. Um, and I, if, if, if you haven't had a chance yet, uh, you must check out his project Lexend and the conversation we had around Lexend and the, really what was so great about that is we got into like uh, the metaphysical implications of, of type of, you know, the fonts in different things, which was so fun. So I enjoyed that so much. So how have you been, Thomas? You've been doing all right? I'm doing great, Daniel. Great to be Excellent. Here. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here. And, you know, Mr. Jockin, I, I enjoyed your conversation uh, with the one and only Johannes on um, Heidegger, Aristotle's. You wrote a great essay on, on thinking about Heidegger and in terms of Aristotelian thought. And what was that about exactly? Because I, I just really enjoyed that. Thank you. Well, the major note was that in, my, in the class with Johannes, it was a fantastic, fantastic mm -hmm. class. I, I kind of sat here reading the text from, the, from this class and a, a kind of like, overwhelming impression hit me of, wait a minute, long story short, what Heidegger is presenting to us, if we take a bunch of his premises, like his main ideas, and put them together, we realize he doesn't have any footing to stand on to make the claims he's trying to claim. The meaning, what I, what I mean by that is that if things don't, if, if there is no ontology of essential essences in individual things in the world, and truth is only right, in the mind of the individual. So it's kind of a psychological sophism, basically. And technology is the, is the ex execution of more and more release of energy for potential mm. use and whims of human desire. Mm. It wears your ground to say we should stop, we should consider, we should be um, reconsidering the implications of technology's impositions or essence by saying that it's corrupt, it's devouring all existence into convertible energy, right? Standing reserve. And mm. I said, that's great. I don't disagree with it, but my friend Heidegger, I believe in essences in the sense that things have, in, have a dignity internally of self-causing existence. You don't. So mm. why would you have any grounds to make the argument that you we should be considering otherwise? If you do mm. think all existence is just in the mind, truth is just cognition of individuals, and desire is actually the only thing that really exists, then we should come devour all reality to please human desire. You have no grounds to tell me otherwise. Hmm. And that was the, and that, but I acknowledge that like, you know, I don't have an answer for you. I'm just pointing out, this is what I'm seeing. And by the way, I don't even think you really believe in your epistemology of what truth is, because if you're talking about the fact that people run away from death, meaning there's some accounts, some accounts are more true than others right? Hmm. Because there's a point of things omitted. There's things lacking in the account that are true in reality. And that prep, that kind of good in the sense that there's something we, we desire having the truth. That's a good. And we wish to possess it or to witness it as hmm. something that's something beautiful and desirable, right? Hmm. So, Heidegger, so basically, Mr. Heidegger, I love your thinking. I'm just, I just agree with you that we flee from death and all this yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Um, and the they tells us what to think. And there's a kind of false city. But that's my point. Then there is some accounts more true than others. Mm. And then we keep going. And then we can stack this with this basic discussion of the philosophical project for a very long time has been talking about things moving from internal essences to external causality, right? Mm. External necessity by, either, by material, by hypothetical means. And that was a thread of the, of the Johannes S uh, discussion. Mm. Um, with some fun end problems of like, okay, so what, what is substance? What is this thing? What is this thing that Heidegger at one point dismisses, but seems to have to acknowledge is there at the same time. Right. Um, and I'll be fair. Actually, I think the commentary on that video was really great. Mm. I forgot the name of the individual, but I totally agree with one of the individuals that commented. I think the safekeeping of what Heidegger is talking about is lack in difference. He said mm -hmm. difference, but I agree. I, if I, I would broaden that be mean to as a kind of lack, I would totally agree with it. Um, I think that's totally correct. And that's being mm -hmm. charitable, Heidegger, he never says that. But that's, I think, a very charitable answer to what is substance, which leads to a whole, again, like I said, we had an amazing conversation a year ago, and you can tell the quality of a thought by the acceleration of the idea. 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, not just from yourself, but Javier and I believe and a whole bunch of other individuals yeah. have been running with this idea of black in mm -hmm. many different directions. And I think that that's a testament that something significant being discussed here uh, in terms of every domain, I think, of the philosophical project, right? Ontology, epistemology, oh, yeah. ethics, all the way through. And that's, uh, you know, by the way, your recent essay on investigating Heidegger and Hume, I think is a beautiful artic articulation of this movement or this th way of thinking. Mm. I very much appreciate it. Well, well, thank you. My goodness. Well, no, it does seem pretty wild. You have, um, you know, where you mentioned in that conversation, you know, a lack in Aristotle, you know, an absence with a form. And now you have kind of the psychoanalytical movement thinking about um, lack with Cadell and Ebert and these different people, and these different people coming together where there's a sense that there's some component in thinking that has been missing, some kind of not just being, not just nothing, but lack, this kind of third ontology that we are experiencing today on an emotional level, but the very in post-modernity or meta-modernity or whatever modernity we want to call it, uh, you know, that we are experiencing, that the very fact that we are experiencing discloses something about us in our being that makes that emotional feeling possible. So what is it about our being that makes that state possible, right? Um, and, and how do those things go together? Um, yeah, you know, when you're, when you're mentioning um, Heidegger, um, you know, one, when he's talking about the idea that we have a, you know, where he connects metaphysics and technological thinking, where if I say, oh, the perfect cup, the form, the platonic form of a cup is, you know, uh, this cup right here. Well, then I'm going to make every single cup with mass production like this cup. And so then a metaphysical idea um, becomes a possible ironing out of difference and destroying particularity and b individuality and so on and so forth. Um, where, again, I think, like you say, of a, chari a charitable reading of Heidegger, um, who, again, his work is invaluable uh, in locating, dare I say, the essence in the difference and making that what you want to maintain. Um, there you start to kind of say, okay, all right, well, then the difference is the safeguard to that metaphysical thinking. And any metaphysical thinking that is ironing out difference in favor of a universal, universal form is what we want to get rid of. And that's how I think if we understand the ethics of Heidegger, in a sense, is what we lead to. And that's where, like you mentioned in the Hume paper, um, I think understanding Dave, um, David Hume, for me, is a philosopher of suchness, where he bases his ethics on the realm of suchness in the common life or the habitat in the sentiment of the community, um, because he understands that if you don't do that, people can get an idea of what the community can look like from the outside and then come in and force it to conform with that. Um, and to me, to understand what Heidegger is doing um, and to not have it just be an upright um, contradiction where it kind of cancels itself out, which I think is a fair reading because I don't think, like you say, it's clear in Heidegger. But again, I haven't read everything. I understand there are thousands of documents that are not translated from Germany, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I always think it's just a healthy enterprise to favor the most charitable reader uh, interpretation of a reader. Because, you know, in my life, I find that what forces me to think hard is when I assume the person I'm talking to is right. Like, if I just assume the person I'm talking to is wrong, well, I don't have to think because I already have the right thoughts. But when I assume the person who I'm speaking with, who I disagree, is right about something, well, then, then that forces me to think harder. And if ultimately they still are wrong, I'll have earned it because I had to go through the process of really exploring it. Um, so understanding Heidegger, like you say, in terms of suchness, which is the maintaining of difference, um, that kind of brings it out how these things can go together a little better at least because to understand what I mean you know David Hume um and when I almost want to kind of put the conversation that we're having under the umbrella of the the lack suchness solution to the problem of is ought that you always hear um David Hume is famous is quite famous for that is ought problem where he said you can never get from is to ought so for example you can never get from the idea of what a cat is to what a cat ought to do. And per usual, I'll probably make examples of cats because I tend to have some need to use cats in my examples. Um, so you can never come from the idea of a cat to what a cat ought to do. Well, that sounds like he's throwing out the moral life, right? He's saying that you can't do anything because you can't determine from isness to ought. Ladies and gentlemen, it's quite important that he follows that up by saying, therefore the ethical delight life is determined by sentiment, habit, and common life. 
Okay, we hear all that and it just sounds like some vague stuff he throws into air so you're not left hanging over a void. No, 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 this is really important. It's also important to realize that Adam Smith's um, theory of moral sentiment is basically a response to David Hume's own theories of how the moral life forms. What David Hume basically wants to say is that you can only determine what a cat ought to do from a particular encounter with a particular cat in a particular setting. Because, because if you don't do that, you're going to be operating based on a general idea of a cat and you're going to miss difference, detail, and particularity. Because like right now, if I were to ask you, what is a cat supposed to do? Or you would say oh, it's supposed to eat. So you say, oh, so I ought to give it food. It needs to be pet, so I ought to pet it. Well, guess what? This particular cat right here has a big rash on its back. And if you pet it, it's going to hurt. Oh, by the way, if I were to ask you, does a cat need screws? You'd be like, no, cats don't need screws. Oh, but this particular cat right here actually is missing its front legs and it has like wheels for legs. And so it actually ought to be given screws or otherwise it can't walk. So there's a particular example of a cat that you can only see the particular needs that it has and also things that it lacks in order to determine how it ought to be treated. But if you just say, no, 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 all cats are like X, well, one, this cat doesn't fit into your category, so you kick it out and you get rid of it. And two, you start to conform all cats to your idea of what the cat is. So what David Human is saying is that isness can be used to oppress. Isness can be used to totalize, thus leading to totalitarianism by making everything fit into your idea of isness as opposed to determining, determining oughtness from an experience of suchness. And I think if we want to under, like if we're being charitable to Heidegger, it would seem that there's something similar going on. He doesn't want us to have an idea of how cups are and therefore iron out difference to meet that thinking because that's going to be in service of technological thinking and mass production. He wants us, he uses that language, if I recall, kind of the disclosure of being, which I associate with suchness. He wants beings to disclose themselves to us as opposed to us conforming them. Well, if we think of Heidegger then as trying to preserve suchness, and determine oughtness from suchness, well, then that can fall in line with David Hume's project to avoid um, uniformity, totalitarianism, and violence that can that can enact itself on grounds of the moral life. Um, so, you know, trying to trying to think of um, Heidegger as a child of the Scottish Enlightenment, I, I find um, a lot of fun. Yeah, no, there's a lot being said there. I mean, listen, the the very first part is his idea of that sentiment, habit, and custom, right? That, there's a very, like, I think the project of rationality being logic misses the point. Yes. In the sense that Aristotle made it very clear. There is something superior to reason that imposes onto reason. Reason is an instrument, like the mode of reasoning, right, is an instrument. The one practicing it is something very different. There's a term for that that basically gets translated as rational wish, oasis. Hmm. It's a, this is what I believe Hume meant, because that is actually the, the finding of the first principles in the first place, right? To a move, basically, uh, reasoning, right? The, hmm. the premises, for example, or basically the first, I would argue, um, we don't see, we, I don't think we, we, if we acknowledge that we don't witness essences directly, we do observe blacks. Mm -hmm. And that is a very powerful instrument because, um, well, generally it's been dismissed as basically like not reliable because it's basically, the, it's basically like if you don't, you can't use blacks in and of themselves until I've actually, I got curious. One of my major projects have been, how can we reason from blacks? How can we use mm -hmm. this in our mode of reasoning, especially on the moral life, right? Um, and I think I found examples of it. It is possible. It's not impossible. And enables have used it. Um, it's not common though. But with that said, that kind of sentimentality is not psychological sophism. I think that's also another, that's a kind of a problem with Hume, readings of Hume, when you don't have a deep enough understanding of what he's trying to get at, is you could just collapse that into sophism uh, yeah. or emotionism, right? That is just my emotive preferences, right? So when he says that reason is guided by the emotions, right, by motive, by like sentiment, um, that usually gets interpreted as, well, just, just ad hoc reasoning. You have okay. feelings, and you're now you're going to apply your reasoning to justify what you felt. No, I believe if you look at it from a traditional point of view, of uh, oasis of this idea of a rational wish, there are things we desire because we encounter lack, such right? Because lacks are attributes that encounter we encounter 
And something about it compels us to know there's something more than what's presented in front of us. And that is what is, is the guiding star, right, to move us forward. Almost a, to use a theological account, I kind of moving in the dark, in the dark cloud of unknowing, right? Mm. Something's compelling you forward to use reasoning, to use dialogue, right? To use the instruments of, of discourse and reasoning to come to ideally seeking out the essence, never, 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 never landing to it, but lacks still to exist, to actually be possible, require, they have a necessity to require ontological existence or whatever is lacking means that some absolute existence of it must exist. Otherwise, and more importantly, especially when it comes to us so instantly and so naturally, then we're stuck with a question of what to do with it. And I think that's that sense of, and it, it and then does move the emotions too. That's the thing too. I, I don't think take, taking reasoning as a dispassionate distancing is totally reasonable. I think it has some reasonable context in your essay talk about it, but also there are moments of truly the sentiments do move us. Because for example, even the desire to want the truth, yes. the same truth is good. And it's something that should be possessed or witnessed. That is a set, that is a, that is a rational wish. That is a, you cannot justify it on any other ground than that. Um, and I think that's super, I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, and the last note related to that is that dispassionate rationality of autonomous reasoning and it's a complete disaster because it does exactly what you're talking about. Oh, we don't need customs. We don't know tradition. We don't need the particulars of the ground level to inform us of what's lacking. And that guides us bottom up, basically from the ground up to reveal to us how we ought to move and how we ought to govern ourselves and relate and be and act, et cetera, et cetera. No. It could be autonomous, just rationality, a hypothetical necessity of the mind, just imposing onto reality. And that's, that's, that is supposedly, the, that's the, I think I agree with you that this is the, ultimately your essay is trying to point to is justifications for a grounded rationality based on modes of knowing that are not just autonomous reasoning. Uh, well, absolutely. And, you know, the, the um, critique of Heidegger that you're bringing up about there's ultimately no essence by which one can determine, even if suchness is aligned with that essence to determine the moral life, is still a problem that I think you have in Heidegger. Because even if you put, I think Heidegger, even if he moves um, our focus to suchness from isness in some way, to the disclosure of being versus our ideas of being, there still is ultimately going to be a question, well, how even on those realms do you determine essence? So I, I didn't, you know, I, please don't mistake me also as saying that that critique is invalid. You know, I'm, I'm the charitable understanding of Heidegger is I agree with the movement to the realm of suchness, but then the question is there is still a step missing even if you make that move. And that's a topic we can get into. You know, a few things, you know, David Hume was famous for being an, a historian at his time, not as a philosopher. And he spent all of his time, um, he spent a lot of time researching religious wars, uh, the violence of the king and the queen and different things like that. And he, starts to realize that very often the worst tyrants in history um, are moral in their own eyes, that they view themselves as good. And in fact, the worst tyrannies almost necessarily have to bring with them a component of being um, moral, because otherwise they can't get people behind them. They can't really do a lot. There has to be some like a greater good sort of thing. Not always, of course, but he sees where this occurs. The other thing that he sees that is very problematic, and actually um, Bonhoeffer kind of writes on this in Presence of Letters, is the problem of um, stupidity on not knowing what you're talking about. Because if you don't know what you're talking about, then you also lack a frame of reference to realize you don't know what you're talking about. Like if, if I say, oh, this town here needs to get a, a windmill and someone comes up and says, who lives in this town? It's like, no, 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 we don't have a windmill. There's actually a windmill on the other side that send, that takes care of the, uh, the grain and different, or whatever. If the person's never been there, they'll say, well, you're just lying. You're just saying that. You just don't want to use your tax money for the windmill. The person's like, no, it really is. And then they just put them in jail or something right there, right? You know, you, you literally, if you are uninformed, you cannot even know that you're uninformed. And therefore, you will have good reason to go ahead with your project. And so you, so when you don't have encounters with suchness, if we just use that language, that I'm, the particularity is basically what I'm saying. The particularity of a town. One, 
it's going, you're going to necessarily, whatever idea you have for what that town should do as the king or whatever is going to necessarily strike you as good because basically if you think something you think it's good to do, even if it's only in your own self-interest, right? So it has, it's going to have a moral flavor to it. Um, and then second, you're not going to be informed by the actual information of that lived life to know that what you're thinking is wrong. And so it's going to necessarily bring itself as being the right thing to do. And so power and totalitarianism comes in and it, and it, and it takes over. And so David Hume has studied this and he's going, oh my gosh, uh, ideas of isness uh, are really, really dangerous. And how do we keep power from being able to come, come across with that? And he's like, well, first let's deconstruct is and ought. Because once you tear those apart, you can't uh, self-deceive yourself into thinking that you're doing something good for a town you have no involvement with. And let's place the moral life on the realm of the common life, on the everyday experience. And actually, I think Heidegger and his critique of technology is doing something incredibly similar, even if ultimately we have a problem with maybe the incompleteness of his, um, of his program. But, you know, we can get into that. Well, what's so bad, though, is we... We don't understand this is what Hume is doing because we read him through the lens of our own time or through Derrida or through deconstruction or, or different things like that, where we say, well, it, it ultimately comes to the life of sen you know, sentiment and emotions and, and the passions and different things. We say, oh, well, he's just talking about relativism. Relativism does not exist back then. That is something that came around in the 20th century that now we think about. This is not relativism. More so what he's trying to say is that rationality always comes after focus. And what do we tend to focus on? Um, things we have an emotional connection with. Um, you know, likewise, you know, and he's, remember, he's in, his really good friend, Adam Smith, is famous for that passage in where he talks in the moral sentiments where he says, you know, if I were to hurt my thumb, I'm gonna be more concerned about my thumb than if a disaster kills a thousand people in China or whatever. That's just how we are. Our brain feels the thumb so we think about the thumb, and that is what all of our thoughts go to naturally. We may not like this about ourselves. We may wish it wasn't true, but we tend to be more concerned about when we hurt our thumb than when something devastating happens with some people we've never heard about. So another way to think about this is rationality is always focusing on and about what is actual to you and what impacts you. That doesn't mean you're wrong. That doesn't mean when you have the process that goes, my thumb is hurt, therefore I need to get a Band-Aid. That doesn't mean that line of thought is wrong. It means what you focus on is relative to what you feel, what you're involved with, what is concrete. The concreteness determines the direction of what rationality tends to go in. And David Hume would even go so far as to say, and that's probably how it ought to be. Because when you start saying, oh, these people in China are, there's an earthquake that's killed a thousand people. Well, unless you live in China, Unless you know what those people are going through in the details, you may run in and actually make it worse. Now, maybe you could say, send over $10,000 and give it to people who live in that community and know what needs to be done. But David Hume is very concerned about the idea of, well, let's run over there and help them. Uh, because he's like, well, no, you're not involved. You don't have the information sources. Um, and in fact, the, the likelihood that you will care about that community you are not part of when you go over there, as much as you care about your own community and therefore will use rationality in a productive way is very, very low. And so focus on the, the common life and on the suchness and have a certain humility when you are going to maybe help people that you don't know about or, or different things like that. Figure out a method would you, you know, because what is the problem that you sometimes have with foreign aid, right? It's kind of very similar. You have countries come in, tell a country what they need and what they do, and they make the situation a whole lot worse, even if they have an idea of what needs to be done. And even if that country has truly suffered, the way you do say foreign aid always has to be humble to the actual people who live in those communities and know what bed. And there needs to be a discussion and a dialogue and different things. So if you take that seriously, what that's basically that concept is what David Hume is getting at with sentiment and emotions and all of those things. But we miss it all because we're reading Hume after Derrida, basically, and, and arguably after a misreading of Derrida, if I wanted to be charitable toward even Derrida. Um, but that has really gotten in the way of understanding how much he's focused on emotion. And to bring it to bring it to what you were saying on lack, emotions are deeply shaped by lack deeply shaped by what we're lacking. Um, what we think, you know, what we ought to do is determine if my um, finger is cut open and I am therefore lacking a healed finger, then I feel like I ought to go get a Band-Aid. Lack organizes 
becomes an organizing principle of what I determine I ought to do. And where, and where I have the most intimate connection with lack, and basically the only place I can experience lack is in suchness, in, in particularity. I can never experience the lack of another person, for example. I can never experience the lack of another town or whatever. I experience mine. But when I think in terms of being as the source of the moral life, as opposed to lack, where I say, well, they're a town just like mine. Oh, they're just another group of people. So yeah, I know what to do. I'm a person. I can go over there and you know make their lives better. Well, yeah, you go over with your good intention and you you cause a, a lot of trouble. So there's something about lackness that also that lack, lackness, huh? You know, lack that brings the focus onto the suchness that can resist these tyrannies of um, tyrannies of good intention. Uh, these flattening out principles that unfortunately can can uh, can cause so many different problems. Yeah, I mean, this is basically your A slash A versus A slash B models, right? right of ethics. Um, actually, my no I had notes on it. One was that the A and A A to A ethics is basically a law of uniformity, right? That my model of needs and moral oughtness and all that is equivalent to yours. Or yes. So obviously, I get to do a one to one mapping of what I did for me and then do it for you, right? Or et cetera. So all the examples are based on that kind of A to A relationship versus A to B is a note is an acknowledgement that I mean I basically had a law, basically I wrote my note the law of big numbers in the sense that individually things are particularized and different, but and we part and have a little bit of uncertainty naturally built into it. However, when we scale out to see this as a whole, we realize there's a coherent logic or structure. Basically, I, lacks are very are like not notions of definitions that kind of impose onto things, and it's very tight grip kind of mode. I think in, in in the spiritual world or the spiritual theological accounts, lacks are this kind of soft openings. They're like a, they literally are. I think a subsistence. Like it's literally like kind of subsist as, as substanding. Like it's it's everything existence is substanding in lack basically uh so there's something holding everything together but it's not a tight grip it's a kind of very soft open hand um just like the law the principle like the, the central limit theorem for example right the, the idea that individually you're going to get randomness and it's unpredictable but you'll get a gaussian usually gaussian distribution for example mm. right you zoom out over a long enough duration of time and and outcome and um uh, outcomes, right, or mm. events, right, that play out. Um, so that that I definitely agree with that hundred percent. And then this particular, I think, also that's the thing too is that I think it's been a horrendous mistake to take um, again the idea of embedded rationality versus autonomous rationality. This is one of the biggest problems in the sense of this, this mode basically makes the art. If you go with that agreement, this argument of the A to A model and basically rationality should be unbound by customs or any groundedness, you're going to say no. Nation states are ir irrational. We should be one. Yes. One. Oneness yes. overall. Yes. And we should be one state. And there's no rational justification to have nation states or any distinctions between people and da da da. Um, I think we know from personal, just on the basic example of a pr basically proximity, right? Things that are closer to us have higher impact. Even just the example, yeah, than losing your finger, for example. Um, I know, isn't that interesting how much, like, again, and also from, you know, Aristotle made a very important point about, you know, because striasis, which is where our term lack, we're using the purpose, the purpose of using lack because normally it's translated as privation. That's a very loaded term in philosophy. It causes a lot of mess to try to rework that. But that's why I've been referencing using lack instead. But there's other sub meanings of it. And one of them is to undergo pain, right? To suffer. So there's this idea that this compellingness pulls through with us. So that's why like the use of a cut or losing your finger is a lack that imposes onto you by something taken away by you um, that strikes you very poorly. That's, I think that's a structure of reality. That is not just sentence. That is not just emotion. That is a structure of reality that we work with. Um, and I think that's a basic prince. I agree. I do agree that that's one of the things that is lost. If you try to go for this abstracted intellect or reasoning and by the way even our I talk about lexan and typography the very fact that reading is an embodied act it's not just this cog like we're not brains and bats just getting cognition from brain to brain directly right this is kind of embeddedness that our body 
is very much in relation with the mind. They are operating together. I mean, one of the, just to summarize one of the points from that, just for anyone who didn't watch that lecture or discussion, excuse me. Um, when you're reading, there's a, when you're looking at the marks, you're going, even if you're reading silently, your neurons are activating as if you're reading out loud. Mm-hmm. So basically your tongue, your mouth, like all the positions you do to produce the sounds that you would have read, your neurons are, are firing off as if you are but yet you're reading silently. That clearly shows there's an embodied knowledge effect that's occurring here in the act of reading. That if you didn't have a body, you couldn't read. That's basically what's being said here, or that's how I interpret that. Um, And by the way, I think actually another note about this principle of proximity as a really, something that if we don't realize knowledge is embedded, rationale is embedded in cultures and communities and particularities, I think the idea of personhood Right, personhood, person is a very important moral category, right? It's a very interesting, very rich category that, as you said, the more I know a person, the more I feel I ought to be ethical to that person. Mm-hmm. Because by my acts of not, not being ethical, there's a growing lack. It's like when, if you do something in basically a, a, a cold or a very uh, unkind thing to someone you're very intimate with, there's something horrendously wrenching in that diff, in that lack that reveals itself from the coldness. Like even if, for example, like you're, if you have a parent or you're a child and you're super, um, you, give them, you're, you're, you punish them hard, you give them a very cold, dispersonal silence, right? It's very cutting. It's very cutting. And that the, the pain of that is because of the moral category of personhood. Like you have this intimate relationship and you're denying it. You're withholding. You're taking away. Um, I think that was a very important part of like, this is, I think, a very reasonable proposition about proximity. I think that's actually a very, very fair point. Um, and also though, I very much the idea of, you know, always from the beginning, even from the beginning, substance was always subcategorized into two, primary and secondary. Primary is the particular, hexit, what gets, you know, what gets called later by uh, Scotus as uh, hexity, right? Basically this, like when you say this horse, this table, that act of, you know, of of denoting is pointing to primary substance, right? Secondary substance is the species, is the genera and species. Also, by, I always love, by the way, ultimately what makes a species a species is species difference. It's genera plus difference. I always love that. So basically, oh, and also, by the way, even Plato comments, it. well, what one is it? Is it, which book is it? I forgot now. Basically, and it's talking about like, what is knowledge? Mm. Uh, they end up including knowledge is a is knowledge of difference that's ultimately what knowledge is isn't that fascinating it's not even a positive term it's a negative term it's i find that amazing from from plato um yeah and also by the way even from your essay i think another thing i think also the humility factor uh there is a very big difference by the way by saying uh x seems to be y versus x is y right that that kind of seems to versus the copula it is a huge effect and actually it poses a kind of mode of how we should reason. Because it basically means like we have to use models of hypothetical uh, reasoning to say, okay, if that's true, if X is Y, then this, then there's some attribute. This is actually where I think this is really important. Um, this idea of suchness that there are attributes that that would follow through. So for example, I mean, one of the examples from medievals is the example of laughter, the human beings, right? So if man is a rational animal, we should laugh because laughing is a, is a secondary attribute of rationality, of reason. Mm. Um, so when we see, when we, when we encounter laughter, it points to, it points to these, that hypothetical thesis that humans seem to be rational would be proven valid, right? Or proven evidence for that. It gives us a kind of grounding humility. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll stop now. I have more to talk about that, it's fine. Oh no, that's, that's outstanding. Um... The difference between seeming and equals is basically the difference between life and death. Uh, And yet the reason we move from seeming to the equal sign is because we want to be alive, because we want to be stable. And that gets into like you were talking about the A is A versus A slash B. You know, like Cadell and I, we always talk about like, um, you know, the, the drive for unity is actually a death drive. Uh, because if you get unity and totalization, there's no difference. And once there's difference, it's just chaos. You know, it's, it's nothing. There's a negation 
I, there's an ironic negation that occurs once you get wholeness. And yet everything in us wants to move from a language and thinking of seemingness to a language of equal to. And yet, so there's this kind of death drive there if we start getting into the psychoanalytics and the Freud. But the problem is often we hear the term death drive and we think a desire to die, but we but that's not quite it. It's not that there's like a suicide. There is a kind of suicidal element, but it's not directly suicidal. It's exactly that the ways we try to go about being fully alive, ironically, calls us to die, uh, causes us to negate ourselves and to lose our individuality. So the key to understanding the death drive that they're talking like Freud is, is discussing is irony. Like irony, that's the other category. It's, so the loss of the category of lack in philosophy and so forth has been extremely consequential and also not really understanding what irony is. Where irony is X seeks Y to get Z, and Y is why X doesn't get Z. Uh, or, and in fact, Y is why Z gets negated. Y is why X gets negated. You know, irony is ontological and very, very deep. It's not just simply like some offish sort of, oh, that's so you know, ironic you hear in this kind of postmodern sense. That's been very bad. That's not a proper understanding of irony, but it's a different subject. Um, on what you're saying about the A is A, you know, something in, a, in the role of difference and so on and so forth. Again, if we're going to the critique of Heidegger, the issue would be, Heidegger seems to want to make difference the foundation for thinking, ultimately, because he gets rid of um, analogy, just like Deleuze. There's no epistemologies of representation. And that difference itself can, um, can, is different. So therefore, you know, you have an A is B that equal, their A is B arises between different things. Here's the problem though. That's not actually a true AB. That's just an example of A with another example of A. Difference actually without essence turns into a new unity. Everything is unified as a difference. Uh, there's no way to bring it together. And here's the issue. The moment difference becomes intelligible, it cannot be purely different. In order to make a difference intelligible, you must be imposing some sort of idea of a form that makes it understandable. Pure true difference would be unintelligible. The very fact that difference becomes intelligible means that you are not dealing with pure difference. You are making it to conform to some sort of idea of intelligibility. And from the paper, you know, in the paper called Dialectical Ethics, basically what we have to do is we need an I ideas are always models and models only work if they find patterns. There has to be patterns. The moment you're dealing with patterns, you're not dealing with pure difference because you're finding similarity between difference. We have to have a sense of similarity and difference in order to make them comprehensible. The name of the game is to not give in to the temptation to turn similarity into sameness, to turn seeming into equal sign, because once we do that, we, we, we're negated. We have a death drive. The problem with similarity is that we tend to want to go too far and to, and to transform um, difference into sameness in order to better understand it. Well, that's going too far, right? So now we have a, we've had, you know, in a sense, we can view Heidegger and Deleuze as a correction to too much similarity towards sameness. But then the problem is if you get rid of, my critique of Deleuze and um, Deleuze notably is if the man would not have gone after epistemologies of representation, the more I go back and reread, difference that he goes after um, judgment, analogy, all of these weight, similarity, all of these different things. The problem is Deleuze, although his ontology is arguably incredibly beautiful, even aesthetically gorgeous in what I call essential difference, without similarity, which requires a sense of essence, because there has to be a sense of pattern. There has to be a sense of the attributes adding up to something that maybe you can never fully capture, but at least has to be possible, or at least you have to at least guess at it. Um, you know, if you cannot do it, you cannot make difference intelligible. So here's the problem. A ontology of pure difference is, a, is actually ironically an AA. In order to get a true AB, and likewise, a ontology of pure being, is AA. In order to get a true AB, you have to be dialectical, um, which then of course is Hegelian, uh, but then we have to get into what is Hegel's dialectic as opposed to the synthesis stuff. It's more like a perpetual tension. Uh, it's more like a fractalizing system. Anyway, it's a different subject. Um, in order to get to a true AB, there has to be a sense of an essence. There has to be a sense of similarity, a sense of, okay, the attributes come together, but those attributes make a cat. They're not just random attributes. There is something that is cat that these attributes point to, even if I can never fully grasp what is a cat in its catness. You know, there always has to be a certain sense of incompleteness, ergo lack, 
as I'm dealing with this. That's the only way to get AB. And so here's, but here's the key point. AB then can only be, in, be encountered in the realm of suchness. AB can only be encountered in the realm of particularity because it is only in particularity that you can, here's the, observe difference as opposed to make difference or to make difference into sameness. The key word I think is observe. Um, you know, you're looking at something, but you're also honoring it. But in order to look at something, you also have to like understand it. So difference has to find a, you can't observe something you can't understand. You can't honor something you don't understand. You, you have to have some level of understanding. The danger is thinking you need complete understanding because then you take the phenomenon and crush it into your system and you use a violence against it. But there has to be enough understanding to where it is possible to meaningfully observe it and then determine ethics based on that level of understanding. Well, that means you can't have pure difference. That means you have to have the possibility of similarity and the, the ability to determine pattern. How do you determine actual pattern? You determine it in suchness. You don't find patterns in your head. You just see the idea of the cat you've always seen in your life. To find patterns between different cats, you have to go into experience, right? And to see each one and to see how cats can be different. And then you can get into the distinctions between accident and essential and errors and all those different things. But that's all based on suchness. So it is only in the realm of suchness that you can get a true AB. And, the, and it is only in ethics based on AB that you can avoid a death drive or a totalitarianism. That is the project of, of David Hume that has unfortunately been read through a lens of relativism and emotionalism to not be understood. And again, I do think Heidegger had a deep understanding of how metaphysics can be in service of an AA project that then creates an ethic that flattens difference and turns it all into mass production. He had a sense of that. But but my critique of Heidegger, and Johannes may hear this and have read something I have not read and dislike what I'm saying, because as much as I love Heidegger and the same with Deleuze, it feels to me like both Heidegger and Deleuze, in throwing out analogy mainly for both of them, um, you cannot have essence or a possibility of essence. Now, I agree with Foucault that if essence becomes essentialism, where you say, I know the essence of things, well, that's not AB either, because you're not acknowledging difference, and also you're making yourself God. So there's a danger with essence, and one could say that Heidegger didn't want to talk about essence because he was perhaps aware of the dangers of essentializing. I think that's very fair, but there's a difference between Essence that you always are humble and observing yourself in light of an understanding that you can never fully grasp, that therefore is always lacking. It is all your understanding of essence is always lacking. That makes essence always incomplete relative to you. You never fully grasp it. Well, that creates a disposition of humility that's very good for thinking, and you can get true dialectics as opposed to the idea of an essence that you fully grasp and therefore can tell society how should operate, what men should do, what women, essentializing like Foucault talks about. There is a danger there. But this is where lack is so important as a concept, because lack can come in and keep essence from turning into essentializing, maintain an A-B dialectic, locate ethics in the realm of suchness, um, and also, frankly, um, make a little bit of excitement to life. Because if there's like, there's lack, there's ontological lack, then there's some sort of mystery, frankly, that we can kind of go deeper into. And we've talked about this in the philosophy of limit, like this kind of movement into. Um, so again, I think, I think today we're, we're actually kind of in this realm where we think difference alone, pure difference, essential difference per se, can give us an AB when actually it, it, it can't. Um, it's going to be another AA just in terms of difference. We ha you have to bring in similarity to make it intelligible. And worse yet, actually, since you are necessarily as a human being making difference intelligible, even if you tell yourself you're not, um, it's like there, there's like this neurotic relationship then with difference where you're disowning your ability, of you're disowning the fact that you're putting it into categories as you necessarily put it into categories. So you get this neurotic relationship as opposed to understanding this need for a dialectical bothness. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my favorite lines, actually it's from Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I remember this when I was in my twenties, I was reading it. It was towards the end. It was just a random note that just caught me. You know, sometimes we hear a sentence and it just like grabs you yeah. and you don't even understand. You, you sense this, the magnitude of the statement, but you're not, but because it's given no other, it's just one line. You don't realize it's like an iceberg, basically. Like mm -hmm. this hip of a massive concept has been told to you, but you don't know yet what it means. Oneness is not sameness. Mm. That's a very powerful statement, right? 
And then, and by the way, we talked off the record. We were talking privately before we recorded. You know, I'm investigating right now William Lockham, and in one of his texts, what he's done, he's basically in the commentary of Aristotle's uh, uh, Oregon, right? And he said, on the, on the question of defining what is one, it's the privation of being. Mm. Oh, that's so good. That is good. So good. Wow. So, if anyone who knows what privation means, that's such a significant point of, it's, it basically explains his nominalism in one sentence. It's yeah, so really powerful. Good. Because it basically, because by, if anyone doesn't know, privation classically was this idea, it, it's a being of reason, meaning it's, with something we, it's a notion in our head, right? It doesn't, and it's not primary, it's only secondary right. to existence, right? Um, so by William Ockham stating that is what oneness is, right and that one is the universality right there is one dog one cat that is the essential by stating it as a privation of being he's basically saying it's just a, it's just an idea in our head dude like that's just what it is it's, it's um, so critical um not to interrupt because then oneness is a a being is a b and you see once you try to make being one you lose it there's a negating principle exactly right and then and by the way it leads to the you know right this whole point of like exactly difference only makes sense in a background of singing Yes. Or thing is actually makes only makes sense in a difference. You guys yes. can both directions on that point, um, and that leads to right basically the idea. You know, by the way, I mean we talk again off the record before we recorded. You know, one of my greatest pet peeves. I think if I if I do any contributions to thought in any sense or anything we do together, right? If we could revive what true ethics is, mm. it's not trolley problems. It is not basically the shelf. The, the shell, they, like going to the supermarket and just picking out by preference your preferred ethical points, right? You're just kind of clicking and choosing. This is what I want today. This is what I want tomorrow. This is convenient for me now. No, ethics was always meant to be a mode of reasoning. This is like art. It's no yes. different than aesthetics being dismissed as basically subjective preference. It's yes. the same issue. Yes, and it's absolutely. Like, no, they are accountable. They are things that can be revealed in discourse and in fact, moral ethics actually, there is a tradition from it, from Aquinas and back where you can use, it has, there's syllogistic reasoning you can use in it. A mm. major premise that's a universal and then a minor premise which is a particular. And in fact, there's error, you can make errors and mistakes and fallacies on both once. And the conclusion, by the way, which is the application of the universal to the particular, blah, blah. Anyways, um, that is not sentimentality. That is not just prefer this preferences off the shelf or playing trolley problems all day about, well, how many people need to be on the, the rail for you to switch the switch in? Do you, can you push the fat man off the cliff to then stop the trolley? I still love when I heard that the first time. I, I, yeah. I had an amazing chuckle. Um, and that's basically like, that's what ethics has been devolved to. It's basically just preferences of choice. Because it's ethics that's unbound by suchness. It's yeah. just you just coming up with an idea of a situation and you can just change the variables all day long. Of course you can. It's pure isness. It's a pure idea. Well, what if the what if there's 20 people on the line versus one? What if it's a what if it's a um, a bullet train that would go so fast they wouldn't feel anything when they die? What if um, you know, what if it's Albert Einstein is the one person we're gonna lose to Nazi Germany if he dies on the train? What about then? There's no suchness there. So there's the variable, another way, the variable is unbound. See, this is what drives me nuts, is you've got all this academic, so here's my attack on academia. Of course, you can make an entire industry out of taking on thought experiments. That's all the, that's what a lot of people do, because thought experiments are unbound by suchness. There is no, there is no relevant moral reasoning that occurs in a thought experiment, unless perhaps you're using it to realize the need for change shifting models relative to suchness. If that's what you're doing, okay. You can, let's put it this way. You may perhaps be able to strengthen your ability to think through problem sets, through moral reasoning, you, but you cannot arrive at any meaningful moral conclusions based on thought experiments, because that is always relative to the suchness of a freaking situation that you have to be in and available to and open to in order to get any sort of meaningful um, revelation about. Oh, it's a, it's dreadful. I, I just wanted to add th th thought experiments like that, like the Trobley problem is isness unbound by suchness. So therefore it's infinite. You can always just go on forever and get yourself tenure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with, no, with actually no grounding to reality and it may, and, and also again, like, it's just preferences. It's just it's just asking the question: When do you subjectively switch? 
like where do you tip the scale? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Relative to a situation you're never in. So what is it? What if you can't, if you, if your switch were to change at 20 people versus 19, that will not give you any conclusion that you can then apply to other situations beyond the thought experiment. It doesn't tell you anything. All it does is make you doubt the legitimacy of moral reasoning. That's all yeah. it does. And then nobody does it. In the same way that if you make people think art is in the eye of the beholder, as opposed to conditional, there is a radical difference between subject and conditionality. I say in order to, re to enjoy the beauty of Tolstoy, you have to meet the condition of being literate. That doesn't mean that Tolstoy is therefore subjective. Yeah, maybe you enjoy Dostoevsky more than Tolstoy because you've had more, because the character of Alyosha reminds you of you because you have met the conditions of connecting with the character of Alyosha because you've gone through a religious dark night of the soul and therefore that book is more important to you than Tolstoy. But the reason for that preference is due to you meeting certain conditions in your life that transforms what teaches you versus not. There's a conditionality involved as opposed to a subjectivity. So it goes with moral reasoning. There are, what is the, what you ought to do is relative to the conditions met by the suchness of a given situation. That doesn't mean it's relative. Here's the, this is why it's so bad not to get the difference between is and such as we are so using it. Because in isness, it is relative because the ontological compositional variables of the situation can move. So it's relative. Of course it is. It's relative all the way down. There's nothing stable. Condition means there is, in fact, a stable ground of a situation of suchness that you have to meet the conditions of to understand. A thought experiment, the very world the thought experiment is taking in shifts every second and it moves around. So, of course, it's all relative. Because there's no stable ontology, dang it. There's no stable situation. There's no stable anything. So yeah, it's relative. It's relative to whatever the philosopher freaking professor happened to come up with that day to complexify the trolley problem. But in the world, more that is relatively solid, you know, we can get through time and but the world is solid. There is a world here. Um, then there are conditions that you meet. Um, there are conditions there of which determine what is moral. And it's not relative all the down, way down. It's conditional on the suchness. Now, a few things. I know the hardness of the world. If we would like to get into the um, virtual reality, everything is Elon Musk, uh, science experiment, whatever, that's fine. Relative to you, it is practically still solid, dang it. You know, you just you just add a practical there as opposed to an actual, and it, it's the, 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 the problem set works as such. Second, I mentioned a cat not having legs at the beginning with wheels. No animals were actually hurt in this discussion, okay? Uh, so don't worry about that, everyone. Um, um, and well, and and again, if if you if you have reasoning that views it, 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 it all feeds together, and then I'll give it back to you. Because if you're led to believe that moral reasoning is always relative, um, well, then you'll say difference doesn't have any similarity about it. There is no similarity to be found because it's all just sort of separating. And so, so of course you're going to have tribalism. Of course you're going to have political, everything falling apart and society pulling far and far. You, you're, everyone's talking about the need for people to come together, you know, to be, you know, to come together to fight global warming, come together to restore political stability. You have a freaking philosophy of pure difference. No, people are not coming together. You have taken away from them the possibility of an epistemology of similarity that could make it possible for difference to come together. Don't get me wrong. That's a great way to fight totalitarianism from the 20th century that was too much based on being. But once you go to pure difference, you can't bring it together. Of course you can. So it all has, I, that was just to point out, again, David Hume is so concerned about how philosophy has sociopolitical consequences. Like he's aware that if you think you can get to ought from is, then you're going to have totalitarian regimes. Similarly, if you have a philosophy of pure difference, then you get freaking tribalism, you know, conspiracy, all this sort of separating where people are getting lost down various Pritchin novel rabbit holes or getting lost in their own groups that make everyone else an enemy. That just logically follows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. So actually, um, this reminds me of the topic the medievals were debating about the hierarchy of the sciences and bodies mm -hmm. of knowledge. Basically, do the higher sciences subaltum the lower sciences. So for example, like mathematics versus optics, for example, like how, what is the relationships of bodies of knowledge? There was a serious debate. Do you have essences that are known within the bodies of higher science that go one-to-one, -one, an A to A model mm. from 
the higher science down into the lower science. So like biology, like things like that. Um, and I, I would make the argument in the way we're talking that more ethics and the political and the political dialogue of science, you know, Aristotle said it was the, it is the highest science mm -hmm. within the domain of uh, non-theology in the sense that it, it orders and directs all the other sciences. So this is why I'm bringing this up to say, do our moral claims have a one-to-one -one map out to every single application, an A to A discussion, or is there information on the particularity of each subdiscipline that informs the difference? Yes. I guess yes. with the higher signs. So meaning basically you can apply mathematics to economics, to chemistry. Yeah, you can, but there are clear differences between cooking and chemistry yes. and uh, geometry, for example, there are differences. So which one is it, right? And I think the point, and the point is when you go for a subultum that is one to one, that oh, you just have to know the highest sciences, and then you just top down, so you can just run it through all the way down to the bottom um, cleanly. That you get totalitarianism, right? Yeah. Basically, you get the complete destruction of the particularity. But likewise, if you go pure particulars. Of, oh no, there's no commonality. There's absolutely nothing bounding this to any other science or any other framing. It also means that, oh no, the moral world life has no bearing to our science, to our politics, to anything, which is hilarious because that was never the understanding historically or traditionally in any sense. Um, so it's neither, so to be honest, neither position is legitimate, right? Absolute unity of the subaltum one-to-one relationship with the higher sciences to the lower bodies of knowledge, to either or complete difference. There's absolutely no overlap of disciplines in any sense. We all know that's nonsense because you could not, how could you possibly, that would mean that you couldn't use mathematics to explain anything about right. any other discipline. And we use mathematics all the time. This is one example. Or I think more relevant to us that the moral life does have grounding in our life. It's not just this individual, again, we, say, every, we keep talking, we keep, we keep hitting against the same problem of, of solipsistic, solipsistic individual preference as morality and, and emotion as morality and moral reasoning, as opposed to what it has always been historically, which is this higher body of signs and knowledge that inform and guide everything below it and have bounding, it has ground, it, it does connect with difference. This is actually why I think law actually has a lot of power here. By the way, law does use analogical reasoning all the time. It's an entire subdiscipline of study within law school. I've always loved that idea. <laughs> um, and the fact that case law always has to have a controversy yeah. that's local, in particular, and then they apply reasoning yes. of universals of the body of law onto the particular. So yes. it actually law cases of controversy of law actually are used very, I think, very reasonably well in ethics classes. I think that actually is a very useful model, far more useful than trolley problems because it actually is grounded to a particular case. So many of the classical um, metaphysicists, um, metaphysicists or meta metaphysical philosophers um, had degrees in law. A lot of them did a lot of work in legal or the courts or different things. Uh, the epistemology that you learn in law is indeed far more, far more useful. Um, you know, a few things. One, I did want to comment on how you were saying that it's always like moral reasoning and, and so on and so forth. Um, it is literally not possible to be um, rational in a vacuum. And what I mean by that is if you were born on a blank, um, if you were in a blank canvas or whatever, um, and you were just like a floating consciousness and there was nothing there right? And I asked you to be rational. You really couldn't, right? But let's say suddenly I gave you a body and you're a body there. And I said, be rational. Well, you say, well, I get hungry. So I'll go look for food because now I have a body to determine what is rational. And you can say, oh, well, maybe I can walk because that's something I could do. But I had to, but now that you have a body, you, you can't fly. Okay. Because now you have a body and you're on the ground. So I had to impose a limit in order to make it possible to reason, which is to say I had to translate possible, I had to kind of lower your potential in order to create increase your freedom because there was nothing actual there in order to uh, in order to to be, in order to become, in order to do things. The the reason of this is the problem is more if if we are being rational, we must be rational, we must be rationalizing relative to an information source that comes before the rationality to make the rationality possible. Right. Because if there's nothing there, you can't be, you know, it's what I like to say is that the true isn't the rational, that the true is what makes the rational possible. Whatever is the case is what makes it possible to reason. The reason this is important to kind of allude to what we've been saying, if there's no essence to things, 
then there's really no information source that is intelligible by which to determine the rational. You cannot morally reason uh, because there's just pure difference, but you can't draw any conclusions about pure difference. The problem with pure difference is in it becoming, in it being ultimately unintelligible uh, because there's no similarity and there has to be patterns in order to be intelligibility. Pure difference cannot lead you to reasoning. You can't get to reasoning from pure difference. Of course, everyone does it as they proceed to talk about it because you have to. The moment you're talking about pure difference, you're reasoning about pure difference. But if pure difference was actually the case, you could not reason about it because you could not have enough similarity in order to conclude the rational. Similarly, therefore, more morality must always be reasoning based on something that is actual something that is there. And therefore it must be an act of reasoning. So that's the horror again of these thought experiments because you're, making, you're, you're acting as if the foundation for the moral life is a thought experience, experiment, something that is not actual, as opposed to locating the information sources for the moral life in the actual, and the actual is ultimately suchness. So you're basing it on suchness. Um, the thing also where you're talking about the overlap between these different, you know, these, di these different, uh, another way to put this is, um, I think the right balance is basically to, in your ontology, you want to emphasize difference um, with the possibility of essence that can only be observed from a place of lack and incompleteness, while in your epistemology, emphasizing similarity, of which is then very careful not to become sameness. And I think that's how you get at an AB. And I think that's where, so again, if my critique, and again, I, I want to stress, there may easily be parts of Deleuze I have not read where he addresses these critiques. There are parts of Heidegger that may address these critiques. I have not read all of the things in German because I do not know German. And I have not, I am no world expert in Deleuze. I always, we've been talking about holding our conclusions with an open hand. Please everyone listening to this, my conclusions are with an open hand. But even if I'm wrong about these particular um, thinkers in their positions on these ideas, the ideas that I'm using these thinkers to talk about, I think are very valid. The problem with pure difference, the problem with throwing out an epistemology of representation. So even if these thinkers do actually somewhere correct these mistakes, um, please do note that I think the ideas that I'm trying to point to through these thinkers are still things that need to be critiqued, um, even if the thinkers themselves correct them somewhere. Um, so um, the other thing, therefore, you're talking about the, the different sciences and so on. Um, the moment you're moving between them, you're, you, you basically must be committing philosophy. You must be, you're not, uh, to use uh, Mr. Lung's language, there are different vectors, uh, kind of different vectors. You know, you have uh, the physical, the mental, or if we're using the school, you, you have science, the theology, science, literature, and so on. So these different vectors. Well, the moment you move between them, and you're, you're, you must kind of be engaging in philosophy because you can't simply be thinking literarily or you can't simply be thinking scientifically. You're trying to think interdisciplinary. Well, I mean, a P, everyone who gets a PhD, whether it be in history or English, it's always a philosophy of. We know that philosophy is the love of wisdom. Philosophy is, I think we get confused about what philosophy is, is because we think philosophy equals focus on philosophical subjects like mind, matter, and different things like that. Philosophy is actually kind of a mode of thinking. This kind of moving between, it's very dialectical, it's very, it arguably is dialectic, and very interdisciplinary, moving between not being bound by a single vector of thinking. In the same way that you're not, so you're a philosopher if you do that kind of movement of thought between the different areas, um, in the same way that you're not a scientist just because you talk about the brain or gravity. No, 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 you're a scientist if you use the scientific method. You have to use a method to be a scientist. I, Daniel L. Garner, can talk about um, quantum mechanics. I am no scientist. I can talk about scientific subjects, but I, have, I don't myself go into the lab. You become a scientist by using a method. Likewise, I think we sometimes get confused about what philosophy is because we think philosophy is talking about certain subjects as opposed to a certain way of thinking. The same goes with metaphysics. We think you're, you're doing metaphysics if you're thinking about in terms of you're talking about soul or body or God or form or different things. No, no. Metaphysics is a certain method that is, one, it comes into existence, existence because you note the impossibility of, us, of escaping the necessity of overlay of the vectors. You see that you can't have meaningful difference without similarity, without a sense of essence and power. But once it, well, then what is that essence? How do you even get at that essence? What does it mean to talk about that essence? Well, then you're getting into metaphysics. So metaphysics is a certain way of thinking 
that is necessary in order to determine similarity and difference to make it intelligible and so that we can function without going off into endless tribalism or uniform totalitarianism. Oh crap, what if all the colleges decided is a stupid waste of time? Metaphysics. Huh. So we throw out metaphysics as nonsense because we don't because we think the subjects of metaphysics are false. Therefore, the method of metaphysics becomes false. We throw those both out, which is a big mistake. And as a result, people don't have the kind of thinking that we're describing that is really necessary, especially in an age of pluralism where difference is so acute in the necessity of determining similarity to keep that from turning into chaos becomes critical, we've thrown out the epistemology that would make it possible to keep that from going in, into a chaotic realm. Um, and I think we're, and then we're just wondering why the world is what it is. Well, yeah, uh, we, we, don't, we don't value philosophy, the metaphysical met thinking that would be able to arrive at AB as opposed to the AA of uniformity, or I guess I could say the BB, of um of absolute difference you know remember the one of the most powerful lacks that we're ever going to confront is our death mm. and remember philosophy one mode of philosophy discussed is the preparation for death mm. i think about that a lot i agree yeah so in a way basically the whole journey of philosophy is to equip us with the i mean the virtue and the bravery to face to understand what is lack because it's coming for us. It's all around us. It's coming yes. for us. It's yes. when when death kisses kisses us, we'll be in its presence all the way. Yes. Yes. So actually, in that sense, the false the the fault the error of dismissal of this entire topic is by that grounded reality we all have to we all acknowledge, right? That our death is coming, and it's a reality that we have to, at the minimum, we need we are prepared. We have to confront, right? Or we don't, we don't even need to. It will come for us regardless. So it's really a matter of our choice. Do we wish to ignore it, run away from it, pretend it's a nothing? Yeah, we, we know that's not true. It's not even a nothing. It's impossible for that to be the case. It's the most actual, most actual things we know in existence. Yes. yes. Oh, or we can confront it. Or we can come, come to meet it and witness it. There, there is no doubt one of the values of Heidegger is this emphasis on the role of death in the philosophical life. And of course, you know, Plato, the philosophy is the good death and so on and so forth. Um, I think the other reason why death, death also is taking difference seriously. Uh, you know, a thing you are not, the negative, you know, the negate, the neg negation uh, in different things. The other thing that I think is really important about death is that everyone's going to die, but everyone's death will be unique. So yes. there's something about death that has a unique blend of difference and sameness, of definite, there's a similarity, but a difference, that death has an AB component to it in of itself, that therefore making it foundational to your thinking will greatly help you in your thinking overall to be more AB than AA, because death is this, this extraordinarily unique event that is universal, but also singular. And there, and so it, it, it's, it's, um, it should be kind of at the foundation of one's um, philosophy. Uh, and, and, think, and that's, but again, I guess to, to close, um, kind of, um, is that, that that's something philosophy did not um, take seriously enough from theology. Theology has always taken seriously, death. generally speaking, religions emerge with death, the concerns of death, afterlife, you know, it's not just that, but death is central to uh, religious thinking. Death is central to religious thinking. Also central to religious thinking is the idea that there are realities our minds can never fully grasp, that we're always going to be lacking a complete understanding of. Um, there's also the tradition of negative um, theology where God is not good, quote unquote, because whatever you mean by good is not what God is. And you know, it would be more accurate to say that God is not. Uh, now, of course, uh, there's, there's complexities, but there's traditions of understanding the role of a certain um, humility in thinking that I think basically a lot of what we get into is how those epistemologies of theology could be very useful for, um, for philosophy today, um, even if one does not follow them to their conclusions. And you see, again, people have thrown out metaphysics because they say it's always religious, right? It's like, oh, it's just theology in disguise. 
No, the, the, the metaphysics just takes seriously the subjects of religion, but that does not mean it is necessarily equal to religion. It takes seriously the possibility of the ultimate incompleteness of thinking. It takes seriously the prominence of death. It takes seriously the possibility of life after death in different forms. It takes seriously the possibility of there being something to human beings that cannot be broken down and understood purely in terms of attributes, that there might be something beyond the attributes. That's what metaphysics does. Religion does that as well. It does not follow that metaphysics must be religious, even if it may lend itself in a religious direction due to similarity. But again, colleges um, and generally modernity has thrown them both out as being equivalent um, because it would almost seem like you need to be trained in them to know the difference. Ah, so if you throw them out, then you don't think there's a difference because you don't have the capacity to see the difference or to see the possible overlay, but not necessary overlay or the possible transition of um, th one way of thinking into another and so on and so forth. Uh, well, if you don't see any of that, then you don't lose anything. And that's kind of the horror, really, uh, I guess I would say. You know, Kierkegaard had that idea that the man in despair is the one who doesn't even know he's in despair, but the man who knows that he's despair, then it can make a difference. One of the great problems is once you throw out philosophical, this kind of thinking we're describing, this A-B thinking, you can't even know you've thrown it out. And therefore, it's kind of like a Calvinistic total depravity that occurs. It kind of walls you in, in a prison that you don't even know you're in, because you just start to think that it's all there is. Um, it's kind of like, um, I guess, I was thinking about yesterday, you know, we talk about Plato's cave and how we have this idea that the, the prisoners in the cave are the people who didn't think and the people who escaped the cave are the ones who thought and use their brains or whatever. Ah, no, no, no. The prisoners are playing a memory, you know, Johannes was talking about, they're playing a memorization game. They're using their brain. The problem is they're not using the right kind of thinking. Hmm? Because the thing is, you know what actually keeps you in the cave? Do you know what the cave is made out of? The cave is actually made of thinking. The cave is made of thinking. It's not that thinking is how you get out of the cave. No, no, no. Thinking is what keeps you in the cave, but it's the wrong kind of thinking. You have to, AA thinking is the cave, where escaping the cave per se is a B thinking. So thinking is not enough. You have to have the right kind of thinking. The difference between the person who leaves the cave and the person who stays in the cave is not stupidity. No, 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 no. It's non-AB thinking. Uh, and so people in the cave can be pure difference just as much as thinkers of pure difference, just as it can be thinkers of pure being. So you have to have that dialectical relationship. Um, but you're, if you've lost AB thinking, as we're describing, you don't, even, you don't even have the ability to know you've lost the thinking and therefore the ability to recognize that you're even in the cave. You know, you're in the cave and you can't, and the cave must look like the outside world to you. Yeah, yeah. I have to reread the uh, the Republic. That's, that's Every time like, I read it, it like changes. It's like it's really deep. Yeah, because I'm trying to remember what motivated the individual who went out to see the sun. What was I forgot? I forgot. My mind's blanking. What was his motivation? Well, it's a great question. There's some, you know, Plato makes an example. He says, well, maybe a guard pulls him out. Maybe he um, is, uh, he's rejected and forced to go out. Plato goes through, if I recall, goes through some hypothetical. But then there's this example where the Heidegger just is mysteriously freed. It's like an accident where he's just freed. It's not, I think what you're getting at is really important. And, and I, um, because it actually is not the case that the Plato has the idea that there's an outside world and that he should go. It's very, it seems very accidental and mysterious. And actually the cave goes to the outside world primarily because he sees something, he walks. I really wanna make this point. It's not, the, the person in the cave acts, he does things, yeah. he goes outside, he faces the pain of the sun in his eyes and he goes, he doesn't just think, he does something. He encounters his suchness of there being an exit here, and he reasons to go out. You cannot reduce leaving the cave to a mere act of thinking. It is, it, frankly, the only reason he's able to think about the outside world is because he goes to it. He does something. And so for me, I really want to stress in the cave that however one interprets it, um, I think it's really dangerous to simply, I think it feeds autonomous rationality, AA thinking, to view the cave as simply an example of someone having a thought Yes. There's action involved there. There's doing. But to answer your question, um, if I recall, it's very, it's, he's, it's basically, he's just unchained and it's not really clear why. <laughs> he just is. A missed opportunity because I think that's actually the most fundamental question at the end of the matter. What wakes up or what motivates that individual who's bounded to unbound themselves, right? Or to, to move to action when they're stuck in a loop of thought? 
that kind of nudge? Is it randomness? Is it chance? Is it desire? I mean, is it, what I'm getting at, is, it, is there a kind of sentiment, right? They kind of connect to your point about humor, right? Or I would argue this yes. kind of uh, rational wish that there's something about the AA model of the shadows presented to this individual that strikes him as untrue. There's something lacking that compels him to wish to move forward, right? Into action, which leads him down this blind path of basically ignorance. Because remember, he goes out to the sun and gets obliterated. No, it's not that really. Well, his eyes and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is too much. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading into that. I fully admit because I agree. I'm just that's not no, that's not presented by Plato. But I actually almost feel like the missed opportunity in the in the allegory because there's a, such an important aspect of that that connects the loop of internal thought of AA to the action to seek out AB. I think you're pointing at basically the deepest, most important question. Uh, because, you know, in a lot of my thinking, I get into where does intrinsic motivation come from? Because in the creative concord, I talk about that's the foundation of the artifacts that creates new technologies and so forth. The uh, intrinsic motivation is what um, calms down the business cycles. Intrinsic motivation is what uh, leads people to like pursuing truth and deeper into beauty. Intrinsic motivation is really, really freaking monstrous. So where in the world, the, the pl basically the person in the cave only leaves because of there has to be intrinsic motivation of some kind from somewhere. Now, granted, he has to somehow get out of the chain. And it's also Plato does make the example of someone forcing him out of the cave, which might be leading in the direction of totalitarianism problematically because we have to lead, you know, that can be read in that way. And there are critiques, say, of, we, um, I, I don't quite agree with Karl Popper's reading of the Republic, but those are things he points at. You can use this model. You say, exactly, the state has to nut, you know, what Popper says is Plato sets up a model where the state can say, yeah, people have to be nudged. So we're going to force the nudge them. And then you use that as a power struggle. But it, but the cave does not have to be taken that way because the the the, the, the version of the allegory that Plato focuses on is where the prisoner takes themselves out. He just makes an example that he maybe one of the ways he could leave is somebody forces them out. Um, the nudge that you're talking about, it, it, are you born with it? Do you, or does it come from your environment? Um, is it something you can learn? Is it something you can't learn? The final, the um, the um, the final book that the true is the rational faith, the beauty, belonging again, all these things add up is kind of the question of cultivating what I um, intrinsic motivation. Because intrinsic motivation is like everything. Where does it come from? What does it? I do think you can cultivate it. I do think there's a way, but it has a lot to do with beauty, aesthetics, thinking in a different way. It is, um, I mean, basically, the look, the question you're asking about um, where does the nuts come from? Like philosophers have made a huge point of ignoring that question. <laughs> um, like Kant's like, well, you do the good because it's rational. And Kierkegaard's like, well, why be rational? Like what starts, what is the first mover of the entire process? You know, basically economics emerges because of the problem of motivation. It's like, how do we motivate people to be productive? How do we create systems of motivation? Because philosophy over there doesn't like to talk about that. They just like to kind of jump on assuming that people will do the good, the beautiful, and the rational. I think of all of them, the, the beautiful is the one that most inherently creates a motivation toll. There's something right. special about beauty. That's why that, the whole fate of beauty book is like beauty seems to be key here. I've been meditating on that point because I think the best way to describe what is beauty is the... The, the desire to witness or possess, right, the good. Yes. And truth is a kind of good we wish to possess or to witness. Yes. So it, I found that as my best way to link the true, the good, and the beautiful together is yes. through pain. And I agree, beauty is how you start because it's that desire, self-motivated desire to possess or to witness, right? That's the, mo that would be the answer for the intrinsic. That's why I totally agree with you, your intuition about that. But this and you know to bring it all together. Um, again, if I'm the irony of Plato is that, but I um, is that there seems to be to to even begin the process of becoming a philosopher king, there is a skipping of the initial nudge. It seems to me there is a skipping of the initial nudge that is explained into that can be best implemented, instigated in terms of beauty, and Plato seems to have kicked art out of the Republic, <laughs> you know? And so then he has to skip that step. Now I tried to, in that talk with Tim Adlin, complexify that a little bit, because actually I would argue Plato is, um, technically Socrates doesn't kick out all poets, just ones that can't be fit into a philosophical mission. And Homer, if you do some reworking will fit. And Plato's also basically suggesting, hey, 
I'm that poet. I'm the guy who can come into the Republic because I fit my poetry and beautiful writing into a philosophical project. So it's a little more complex, but generally Plato views on um, Socrates, Plato, and of course they blur, um, views aesthetics with a skeptic, a very strong skepticism. Well, that means you, yeah, you got to skip the step of how the guy gets out. <laughs> you know, you just got to have him out and then able to act. But the initial question of what makes him take the chains off? What makes him think to get out of the change to then have the experience of seeing the exit and the action of walking out? What instigates all of that? I think beauty is critical. And if this is the case, um, if somehow beauty is the prime, is plays the first mover function in the true, the good, um, the true and the good, that Trinitarian structure, if beauty, um, then a society that basically has no aesthetic philosophy, us, um, we should not be surprised that we have a crisis of boredom, that we have a crisis of no intrinsic motivation, a crisis of the meaning crisis, as Vernanke talks about. And we should be doing everything in our power to increase experiences of beauty and aesthetic capabilities, because that is what starts the philosophical life, the good life, the, the AB life, the life that is not tribal, the life that is not totalitarian, is by having beauty at the foundation. Because ultimately that would mean if beauty has a first mover function, then the fate of beauty is the fate of us. Because if we don't have beautiful experiences, we don't go anywhere and we stay in the cave. Yes. And we're very powerful, right? And, and as opposed to the totalitarian mode of compulsion, right? Remember, compulsion is the in the opposition of the rational. Yes, sir is that it's an unmoved mover, literally, yes. in the sense of it's uncompelled movement, right? That yes. it's, it's by an intrinsic principle inside oneself that you're compelled. You know, one of my favorite, one of my favorite yes. names, you know, the 990s we got from Islam, um, one of them is the compeller, but it's not in the sense of an external force. It's pushing. It's attraction. Attraction, exactly. It's so critical. The beauty and freedom die or rise together. You know, you can't, if um, if I find a human being beautiful, you don't have to create law that forces me to be moral. I will naturally be moral because I find them beautiful. We always treat what we find beautiful with care. And also, I naturally organize by a behavior around it that brings out its optimal state or that best preserves it. Beauty and freedom go together pro freaking foundly. But we just want to talk about how freedom and like education go together. That's all we talk about. Well, guess what? Without beauty, that tends to become autonomous rationality. And so then the very thing, again, the irony, therefore, the very thing that we think will increase freedom, education becomes the very thing that destroys freedom because you get autonomous rationality, which necessarily goes in a totalitarian direction. No, the loss of beauty is a loss of, it's basically the loss of everything. Like if you do not have a culture that has the ability to see beauty, to meet the conditionality of it, and to value beauty as something more than just subjective, as in fact being a result of there being higher conditionalities that we have to rise to, in a, in a nearly courageous and heroic sense, right? If you don't believe in any of that, then nothing takes off. And the good, when we talk about the good, the true, and the beautiful, all three of those, when they exist independent of one another, can become a terror. Beauty without truth and goodness can be used to attract people, like envy or sort of some of the goddesses, different things. You know, truth without good and beauty is just stale and oppressive. You know, these are the facts. It doesn't matter if they're good. But if you have goodness without truth and beauty, it could just be like Satan tempting you, you know, coming from the tree of knowledge, right? So the view, the good, and the truth, they always have to exist together in a kind of dance. They always have to meet. Human, but if we separate them, we're in trouble. We exist in an age that is primarily lost the beautiful, um, that does not really even know what it is or what we're describing beyond subjective taste or whatever. And as a result, our efforts for the good are oppressive, and our efforts for the true are dead. And then we wonder what's going on in the world. And by the way, I mean, one of the biggest contentions on this discussion of beauty is we're not just talking about physical beauty. In fact, every major thinker has always pointed out that the truest beauty yes. is not is the it's virtue, yes. right? That shining forth of beautiful acts yes. that are good and true, yes. right? That's right. Then that's the thing too. Is that actually relates to your relationship of things we treat we think are beautiful we care care is a deposition a relation and Heidegger actually that's like Heidegger is the kills because Heidegger touches on that that sense of care um it's this it's this directiveness of 
how one acts. And that's a very beautiful, and that is true beauty, right? Because virtue is in an act, right? It's a habituation, to be fair, actually, not just one individual act, but it's the fact it's repeated over and over and over again. Both Deleuze and Heidegger are like right there with their emphasis on the aesthetic and the poet. But for some reason, I um, both of them don't want anything to do with epistemology as a representation or similarity. They don't want anything to do with analogy. They don't want anything to do with judgment. I get it. I mean, Deleuze has just watched where people have used similarity, communism oppress totalitarian regimes. They've oppressed people in the name of we're all the same. We're all Americans. Corporations iron things out. I get having a giant dislike of similarity. I do. I do. I do. I do. And I understand that Heidegger has also seen the, the tendency of essentialism, and he has seen some of the problems of religious, the, the, how religion um, uses essences in problematic ways. I understand. But guys, if you throw out um, uh, epistemologies of representation, you still end up in another AA. You still end up in another uniformity that is very problematic you don't have the the dialectic and both of them don't seem um i'm not as i know Del we all know that Deleuze dislikes hegel um and there can be some tendency to not want to associate that I, and but but that movement of back and forth because again if we're thinking of the true the true the beautiful and the good i mean th theologically like also they talk about it as a dance like there, there, there. You can't. It's a the, the dance cannot be reduced to the dancers, but it's not also. It's also not possible with the dancers. It's just, it's an emergent relationship, right? That they all kind of go together, and the dance vanishes when it stops. But when the dance is going on, you can't locate it. But with a mixture of between the dancers and the dancers themselves, it all goes together. So it goes with the true, the beautiful, and the good. Which, um, again, that uh, that is what you're trying to do. That is what AB is trying to do is to create this sort of dance movement, which of course means um, you always have to be an active thinker. You can never get a system that stops moving. You always have to be thinking and examining and that can be tiring in different things. Um, but the only, but that means there's a movement and Hegel's dialectic is the best epistemology that I know of that matches on that movement. If you don't want any, if you don't want anything to do with the philosophy of the right or the philosophy of history, okay, all right. But that dialectic is a very, very important epistemological tool, especially when you think of it as setting up, and it would be a different discussion, and hopefully the piece on how discussion dialectics are not Hegelian dialectics makes this clear. The dialectic is not merely this um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis thing. It is more like this dance structure where it's always making something new out of what pre-existed and then the new reflects back on the old and that makes something new. The old never vanishes in the dialectic. It's always being made new with the new thing that emerges out of the tension of the old and it goes on and it's much more, it's actually much richer than this kind of vanishing act that we have. It's more like a dance. And I, and I think um, that's how we have to think about it. If we're going to keep uh, uh, the world today from devolving into totalitarianism of the right or the left or from devolving into anarchy and tribalism, we need, we need to think um, of, of how to take in the world in terms of a dance between the true, the good, and the beautiful. And I think that's our challenge today. And I think analogy will probably will be one of the means. Necessary, completely necessary. You know, what is courage? What is justice? It's individuated and it's yeah. not the same, yet they are the same at the same time. Like it's that difference in similarity dance, right? That we see because every every exam, example pointing to the exemplar, right? Yes. Of justice, of bravery, of fortitude, of prudence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Is individuated and unique and one right but yet yeah. bounded together in a comprehension that we all understand that we all of his witness basically the the thing is again if if one can understand the critiques against analogy that say someone um like Deleuze seems to to levy are completely valid if analogy is based on isness because yes isness is fundamentally oppressive Absolutely. But if analogy is a necessary method met in the realm of suchness to understand the suchness, well, then it's dialectical and contained. It does not give rise to the oppressive deletion of difference that they are concerned about. But it's grasping the difference between isness and suchness, both of which are right there. Both of them are right there. But again, I, 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 if I'm being charitable, if I'm being understanding, they have, in fact, come through the 20th century, which is, you know, um, 
pretty bloody. I mean, I guess Steven Pinker says it's not actually the bloody, bloodiest century. I, I don't know. Uh, but it was bad. It wasn't good. Uh, the World Wars is not good. We've seen totalitarianism. And again, we, I mean, I can't imagine living during the Cold War, where basically you think you're going to get nuked any single day. So one can understand the attack on, on these things, that can be, these epistemological methods that can be viewed as contributing to the problem. But you create new problems by totally getting rid of them as opposed to using them to establish an A-B dialectic. Um, I mean, the moment, basically, if you use words, you're using analogy. You have to be. I mean, that's Austin Farrow's point where he's going, you know, Austin Farrow's really good on this. Is like, you can't escape it. You think you can escape it, but you're not. The question, analogy, if I'm coming, and then, to, you know, I said to close 30 minutes ago, uh, but, uh, you know, I enjoy speaking with you so much because it's you're so honest. The cave grabbed us. Yeah, it the cave. It was a cave. We tried to escape and the cave came around us and we're trying to get out. Oh, like, we, can build, we had a question. I had to ask the question and they'll let you know that No, it's like the question. I mean, it's the one I think about. It's like, it's what it all, where does the nuts come from? And it, and it seems extraordinarily tied to beauty. Um, and, uh, but, but analogy, um, to their defense, is indeed a kind of fire where if you don't use it in the right conditions, then it will burn you alive. But also without fire, human beings don't learn to like eat and they die of cold. So fire is necessary even if it's dangerous. And indeed, analogy and all epistemologies of representation plus is isness favor totalitarianism in uniformity and are problematic. You are correct, Heidegger and Deleuze. I, you are correct. But once you move to the realm of suchness, they, they're, they're fire that it's like fire kept in the hearth. And actually fire in a hearth can keep you alive because you can cook with it. Like you might need fire in a hearth. To die. And basically that's what I'm saying. Like when fire is in the realm of isn't it, what, when, um, analogy, when, when analogy is in the realm of isness, it's a problem. But also not having fire in your home during the winter is a problem. And we've just gone too far now. Uh, you know, I think we've gone too far. And so it, um, but, but again, if we bring the epistemologies of representation to the realm of suchness, we get AB. And in fact, we can't get AB any other way. Well, sorry. Hmm. well Mr. Jockin, you're outstanding. Likewise to you, Daniel. It's been a great conversation. I've always enjoyed it. I, again, I'll probably be writing on this for the next year, just like our last one for the next year. So that's delight delightful. Um, Mr. Jockin, I believe you had a poem that I wanted you to read. If, if okay. you have a chance to do that, um, that was so beautiful that I thought captured so much of this. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, I saw my friend post it up on Instagram and I, it was, it's perfect for our topic. So I wanted Excellent. to The title is Keeping Things Whole by Mark Strand. We'll post, we'll share a link just so people can check it out later. In a field, I am the absence of the field. This is always the case. Wherever I am, I am what is missing. When I walk, I part the air and always the air moves in to fill the spaces where my body's been. We all have reasons for moving. I move to keep things whole. Mr. Jockin, thank you for your time. Father Daniel.